Tonight, inside the takedown, the weapons, the cash, and the wigs. A crash in Indiana ending a multi-state manhunt for alleged murderer and fugitive Casey White and the corrections officer who reportedly loved him, Vicki White. Authorities say they were found with an arsenal of guns, money, and disguises, and that Casey admitted he was planning a shootout with authorities if they were caught. The deputy turned fugitive dying from a suspected self-inflicted gunshot wound, the move by police that may have saved countless lives. Trump's Twitter return? Elon Musk announcing he would lift a ban on the former president if his deal to buy the social media giant goes through. The apparent about face from Twitter's founder and former CEO who initially banned Trump. What he's saying tonight. Also, President Biden on defense as gas prices hit another record high. The president saying fighting inflation is, quote, his top domestic priority, but adding his administration is not to blame. How he now plans to help ease the strain on Americans' wallets. Mario Batali acquitted. The celebrity chef found not guilty of sexual misconduct after he was accused of groping a woman at a Boston restaurant. The harsh words from the judge during the trial. Prime Minister rescued. Protesters swarming the home of a leader as deadly protests erupt in Sri Lanka's capital. The military now forced to take over. And ads on Netflix? The streaming giant hinting at commercials after its first loss of subscribers in more than a decade when the major change could hit your TV. Top Story starts right now. And good evening. The plan apparently fell apart. Tonight, we're learning new details about the dramatic end in a multi-state manhunt for an Alabama inmate and former corrections officer who helped him escape. Authorities say capital murder suspect Casey White, you see him right there, admitted he was planning a shootout with police as they closed in. However, his plans were hampered after U.S. Marshals used their vehicles to push the duo's stolen Cadillac into a ditch after a brief pursuit. Vicky, who was a decorated officer, died from what appears to be a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Authorities say inside the car they found a cache of weapons, including several semi-automatic weapons, nearly $30,000 in cash, and disguises also discovered. Police tracking down the two after Casey was seen on a security cam at a car wash in Evansville, Indiana. Still a lot of questions tonight, so let's get right to Sam Brock, who's there. Two of America's most publicized fugitives, Casey and Vicki White, dramatically caught after 11 days on the run. Their Cadillac crumpled after a short-lived pursuit from police in Evansville, Indiana. Members of the U.S. Task Force basically rammed the vehicle and pushed it into a ditch. And we later found out, had they not done that, the fugitive was going to engage in a shootout with law enforcement. An arsenal of weaponry found in the car. We could hear her on the line saying she had her finger on the trigger. But the only person to fire a shot, the highly regarded corrections officer, Vicki White, set to receive the Employee of the Year Award next week, who took her own life before deputies could reach her. U.S. Marshals telling NBC News Casey got out of the car, surrendered, and said, please help my wife. She just shot herself in the head, and I didn't do it. Authorities say there is no indication the two were married, though they were clearly disguising themselves quite masterfully with wigs and glasses. Tristan Berger was staying at the same Evansville motel right down the hall following the case and had no clue. And you definitely saw her. Yeah, definitely saw her. Yeah, hair she dyed. walked around, hair dyed, everything. Officials ultimately getting a crucial tip from James Stinson, an Indiana car wash owner. That truck was sitting right there. Who spotted an abandoned Ford F-150 with Tennessee plates early in the week. I said, this is probably that guy from Alabama. I, uh, as soon as I seen him, I mean, the windows are down, keys in ignition, perfectly good truck. There's also the question of why park the car here. Of all the places Casey White could have left his truck, he picked this bay at a car wash next to a sign that says security cameras in use. That security camera capturing the image of Casey that broke the case. All right, Sam joins us now from Evansville, Indiana. So, Sam, after Casey White was taken into custody, what did he tell those U.S. Marshals about their plans? Right, so the sheriff didn't want to divulge a lot, Tom, about their conversation, except when I asked specifically how did he know that Casey White was planning on engaging officers in a shootout, and his response was because he told us so. He said, I am willing to risk my life, as was Vicky, in order to do that. And we also know that there were five guns found inside of the car. We talked about this last week. One of them was an AR-15, one of the reasons that was raising levels of concern, Tom. A serious arsenal, no doubt. So what is next for Casey White? 
So he waived extradition, which means he's on his way to Alabama right now. If you can believe this, tonight, Casey Watt is expected to appear before a judge again at 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night. It's going to be his initial appearance with an arraignment then coming in the next several days. And Casey Watt is also still expected to be on trial for murder starting in June, Tom. Sam Brock with the latest on a wild story. Sam, thank you for that. Next tonight, the major move from Elon Musk. Could former President Trump return to Twitter? Musk announcing today that he would reverse Trump's ban and allow him back on the platform if Musk's acquisition of the social media site goes through. Jacob Ward has the latest. Tonight, Elon Musk promising to make his mark on Twitter, saying he'd reverse the company's permanent ban on former President Donald Trump. I would reverse the permanent ban. I think it was a morally bad decision, to be clear, and foolish in the extreme. The former president's posts and behavior around January 6th caused most major social media platforms to remove him. I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. Then, during the riots, he tweeted this video telling the mom, we love you, and repeating a claim of stolen elections. That, and a pair of tweets two days later, ended his run as one of the platform's most followed users. At the time, then-CEO Jack Dorsey defended the decision, tweeting about the dangers of, quote, offline harm as a result of online speech, while worrying about setting, quote, a precedent I feel is dangerous. Today, Dorsey said on Twitter that he agrees with Musk that permanent bans, quote, don't work, although there should be exceptions for illegal behavior. On Tuesday, Musk argued that the permanent ban has not had its intended effect. Banning Trump from Twitter didn't end Trump's voice. It will amplify it among the right. And this is why it is morally wrong and flat out stupid. But research from Signal Labs at the time found that misinformation about election fraud fell 73 percent on Twitter in the weeks after Trump was kicked off. Trump's ability to broadcast his message has been limited to television appearances, YouTube and Truth Social, the small social media company he founded as an alternative to the platforms that banned him. And other figures who've been banned from the largest social media platforms like Milo Yiannopoulos and Laura Loomer have more or less disappeared from the national stage, according to those who study deplatforming. What we have found is that the audiences uh, thin considerably, uh, their revenue streams uh, decline. So those two things are significant. Members of Twitter's advisory council immediately tweeted their worries Tuesday about, quote, what else would be allowed under Musk's watch. Now, if Musk's acquisition of Twitter goes forward, it seems that Donald Trump will regain his place as one of the platform's most influential voices. And Twitter's content moderation policies will be upended. All right, Jacob Moore joins us now live here on Top Story. So, Jake, the big question is, what will former President Trump do? Well, it's not clear at this point. He's not saying anything today, Tom. But back on April 25th, he told Fox News that he intended to stay on Truth Social and that he would not return to Twitter. Of course, it's hard to imagine him staying on a platform with only 2 million users as opposed to one that has 300 million CEOs and world leaders and journalists. Meanwhile, I've been speaking to people inside Twitter to ask what their reaction is to Musk's announcement. And they say that their internal discussion boards have been more or less silent on this topic all day. And the implication, they say, is that this has been the expected decision all along, Tom. All right, Jacob Ward with some new reporting right there. Jake, we appreciate that. For more on the big picture of President Trump's possible return to Twitter, I want to bring in my friend now, now tonight anchor Joshua Johnson. Joshua, I wanted to get your sort of analysis on this because you're a reporter, but you're also a deep thinker, and you're someone who doesn't like hot takes or knee-jerk reactions. You've had time to think about this today, so, so what do you think? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, now that you've called me a deep thinker, I better have an answer. <laughs> and I will offer you another option. It might not be a big thing. I think a lot of the people who have already gravitated away from Twitter have done so partly because of the political tone there. We know that part of what Elon Musk says he wants to do with Twitter is make it a good space for free speech. But freedom of speech does not mean freedom of reach. He has to figure out how he's going to entice some people back, especially since a lot of people have decided that they don't want to deal with those echo chambers. They prefer Instagram or TikTok. A lot of the online world has already kind of moved on from Twitter. So even if Donald Trump came back today, it could just be a lot of the same sort of circling the drain, shouting him down. People could block him or move on with their lives. But 
I'm not even sure that it would have much of an impact in the net effect. I want to circle back to that point, though. But before I do that, I want to bring up what Jack Dorsey said, the founder of Twitter, co-founder, former CEO. And again, he was part of the, the team that banned Trump initially. And he wrote in part, you know, he weighed in on this saying there are exceptions, but, quote, generally permanent bans are a failure. Again, Dorsey was Twitter CEO at the time Trump was banned. One of the most powerful people in social media. He's going to make close to a billion dollars, I think, off this deal with Elon Musk. I do want to say that. Why do you think he sort of had this about face? Well, I think there's something about Silicon Valley. And I lived and worked in San Francisco for a long time before I came back east. And there's something in the mentality of tech that wants to create kind of a perfectly engineered social solution to societal problems. And I think it remains to be seen if an organization like Twitter can even do that. The United States of America has not figured out free speech, and we pioneered the First Amendment. Right. Plus, I think we need to remember, as Jake Ward rightly said in that piece, that a week after the insurrection, Jack Dorsey said he believed it was the right decision for Twitter and referred to offline harm as a result of online speech. So the idea that Twitter could create a space where that kind of engagement leads to whatever idea they have about what free speech could be is questionable at best, as if Twitter is supposed to be the linchpin of those right. spaces, or even can. We're still trying to figure that out on my show, on this network, yeah. how to do that. So the future of that is as yet unwritten. And to circle back, and I, I think you're right, because Twitter doesn't shouldn't receive all the blame, right? Because there's a bigger issue here. You say this might not be a big thing if he does come back, but then it comes to us, right? The media, the mainstream media, if you will. And how much amplification do we give his tweets? So what happens then, right? Because we've seen it happen before. President Trump would tweet something while he was president, while he was campaigning, and then the news media would pick it up. It's called earned media, and he got more than any other politician on the planet. So my question to you is, can our colleagues, can they not you know, taste that. They've had a taste of that so far. Will they go back to that apple? Will they, will, will, will they basically want to take another hit of that? Well, here's the beauty of where we are now as opposed to before. I think partly because of the way that technology has ex exploded. People can sort of pick their silos. Like, if you want something more opinionated, we're not the network for you, yeah. right? If you want news and analysis, NBC News Now is perfect for you. But you can go a few channels down on Peacock and you can watch SNL sketches all day long. Like, the idea that there's only one way to hear these messages has exploded in right. the time just since January 6th. So even if he came back, and even if every network Blanket in the airwaves with everything he tweets because technology has moved on. There's no way to know that the impact would be the same at all because people are now more savvy in terms of what they want. And the responsibility for us is to figure out how to meet people wherever they are so that if we are what you choose to consume at this moment, we're here. If not, you can go back to streaming SNL. I think those are the two big unknowns. Will people be interested in it? And the other question is, Will journalists take the temptation? If there's news, you got to put it out there. But right. if there's not news, how much how much amplification do you give it? Exactly. Joshua Johnson, love having you on. Going to have you on again. You can, of course, catch Joshua's show now tonight on News Now weeknights at 8 p.m. Eastern. All right, we want to transition now to over to Washington and skyrocketing inflation at 40-year highs, driving gas prices to another record. President Biden today declaring it, quote, our top economic challenge saying he understands the frustration while reminding of the global impact of Russia's war in Ukraine and the pandemic. Peter Alexander reports from the White House. For Americans on the road tonight, another speed bump. Gas prices today reaching a new all-time high. They're horrible. They're ridiculous, man. Can't, you know, seem like you're working for gas. Regular unleaded now averaging 4.37 a gallon. And President Biden is again trying to highlight his efforts to slow the spike. I'm taking inflation uh, very seriously, and it's my top for domestic priority. I know you got to be frustrated. I know. I can taste it. Inflation now at a 40-year high. Prices surging on gas, groceries, and rent. Auto repair shop owner Wilson Halley says prices for parts are so high, it's costing him business. The customers aren't coming in because the prices are too high, and they have to hold off on the repairs. They'd rather drive without the repairs than come in and pay the price. Correct. And single mother Yolanda Alexander tells us she now has to work multiple jobs. I could go in a grocery store and spend $60 and I'm looking like, what did I purchase? For groceries and higher rent. One paycheck now just covers the rent. I shouldn't have to work three jobs just to do the extra. One job should suffice. 
But tonight, President Biden says he's not to blame for prices that have been skyrocketing for nearly a year. I think our policies help, not hurt. And taking aim at former President Trump's MAGA movement and its allies. The MAGA Republicans are counting on you to be as frustrated by the pace of progress, which they have everything, they've done everything they can to slow down, that you're going to, will hand power over to them. But tonight, a top Republican is blasting the president. Let's look at the Biden agenda right now. We have 8.5% inflation. We've got the highest gas prices ever. So, I, I mean, this ha he doesn't have any ideas. All right, NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander joins us now. So, Peter, tonight everyone is bracing for those new inflation numbers tomorrow. What can we expect? Yeah, that's right, Tom. So the question is whether those inflation numbers are topping out or continuing to rise. Right now we're above 8%. Today the president told me that one thing he's weighing is whether to lift former President Trump's tariffs on Chinese products that could help lower costs here. The president will be watching closely when those numbers come out tomorrow. We heard from the Treasury Secretary today saying that she expects this volatility to continue into the future. Tom. All right, Peter Alexander for us at the White House. We're going to turn out to some severe weather in the forecast and the growing fire threat there in the West. New video showing the extensive wildfire damage. Look at that in New Mexico as strong winds continue to fuel the flames. The biggest blaze burning more than 200,000 acres so far. Officials say it's only 39% contained. NBC meteorologist Bill Karens joins me now on set live tonight here on Top Story. And Bill, we see your boards on fire right there. It's exploding. Uh, we have dangerous fire conditions and it's dry and it's hot and it's windy and right now this fire is just ramping up and it is just exploding through the mountains of northern New Mexico. This is the visible satellite imagery. It's pretty cool. We actually get these images every one minute so we can put them in a loop so you can actually see the clouds. This is the smoke plume from the fire and the bright white clouds, what we call pyrocumulus clouds. So typically you get the fire smoke and it kind of goes low to the ground and it's bad for air quality. This fire is so hot that these clouds are exploding into the atmosphere about 40,000 feet. That's where you're flying your jets when you go from state to state and those can sometimes even have lightning strikes with them. So that just shows us it's extreme fire behavior right now. They told us yesterday this fire consumed 20,000 acres. So right now it's over 203,000. Yesterday was 20. When I'm seeing something like this today, we can get easily another 20 today and another 20 tomorrow. The biggest wildfire in New Mexico's history goes almost up to about 300,000. We could be close to that by the weekend. I mean, that's just show how crazy this fire is and how unusual it has been in areas of New Mexico. And it's all because of the fire conditions and this prolonged drought and climate change. Add it all together and you get the recipes for things like this. So tonight and tomorrow, still looking at red flag warnings. The rainfall in this region has been about 5 to 25 percent of normal. And that's not just New Mexico, by the way. And the summer outlook from California all the way to the plains is for increasing fires and bigger fires than normal. So we'll keep an eye on that. And as far as tornadoes go, we do have a tornado watch for our friends in areas of Wisconsin. We do have from Texas all the way through West Texas severe thunderstorm watches. And finally, and this has been a huge issue I mean, the next map, this big storm off the East Coast. And Tom, let me end with this video off the East Coast sent to us from the Cape Hot Hatteras National Seashore. This was one of two homes today oh. that the ocean consumed. Persistent flow, rising sea levels, and you know these large waves. You know The Outer Banks are gonna be one of the first locations in all of our lifetimes that will eventually be uninhabitable. Um, those homes were deemed unsafe. The people were not in them. But that home is now lost to the ocean. And built on silts right there. It's still not, not able to withstand that. All right, Bill, we thank you for that. We head overseas now to the war in Ukraine where Russia is ramping up its attacks in Odessa. Seven missiles fired into the port city that had been relatively unscathed in the war so far. President Zelensky warning the blockade of ports like Odessa could threaten the world's food supply. Kelly Kobier is on the ground for us. Tonight, the crucial southern port city of Odessa in the crosshairs again. Ukraine says Russia has fired seven missiles at the city, hitting a shopping center and warehouse, killing a security guard. This facility has nothing to do with the military, Odessa's mayor said. There are no ammunition depots here and never have been. Several buildings have been reduced to rubble. Odessa, almost untouched in the first two months of war, is now being targeted nearly every day. Tonight, Ukraine's President Zelensky warning the Russian blockade of ports like Odessa is threatening the world's food supply. Ukraine produces about 20% of the world's high-grade wheat used to make bread. 
The U.N. says nearly 25 million tons of grain is now stuck in silos. While the war still rages across the east. Anna and her husband told me they fled their home city of Severodonetsk, now under constant Russian shelling. There was no gas, no water, and my best friend was killed when she went out to find water. I'm so sorry. It's so hard to bear, she says. She told me her husband lost his eye when he was 10 during the siege of St. Petersburg in World War II, now both living through another war. Who do you blame? Putin, of course. It's Russia. We didn't invade anyone, she says in Russian. Even though we're old, she told me, we still want to live. Anna and her husband are now among the more than 12 million Ukrainians displaced by this war. And the United Nations says the vast majority, nearly 8 million, are still here in Ukraine. Tom? Kelly Kobiea for us. All right, Kelly, thank you for that. We head out to Sri Lanka where violent anti-government protests are raging despite a nationwide curfew. The military temporarily taking over power after protesters burned houses, buses, and even swarmed the prime minister's home, forcing the military to go in and rescue him. Kristen Dahlgren reports. Tonight, chaos in Sri Lanka as the government is upended. Violent clashes this week left at least eight dead, 200 injured, and caused the prime minister to resign. Remnants of burnt buses and smashed vehicles now litter the streets of Colombo. As protesters refuse to let up, continuing to chant anti-government slogans, blaming Sri Lanka's now former Prime Minister Mahinda and his brother, President Godabaya Rajapaksha, for leading the country into its worst economic crisis in decades. It's a corrupted government. The present regime of Gotabaya Rajapaksha is corrupted, so much so that we don't even have basic health facilities in Sri Lanka. On Tuesday, Sri Lanka gave emergency powers to its military and police to detain people without warrants. Reuters reporting the defense ministry ordered its forces to shoot on site anyone, quote, looting public property or causing harm to life. Demonstrators defying a nationwide curfew swarm the entrance to the president's office for the 32nd day, demanding he quit. He has not yet. But just hours after defending the government, his brother, the prime minister, resigned as his supporters hit protesters with wooden and iron poles in front of his offices. More than a dozen houses belonging to leading politicians were vandalized. Local TV also showed protesters toppling buses and pushing cars into the water. The protests had been mostly peaceful up to this point. Now, yesterday was a marked a change in that peace in that peaceful nature of the protests, um, but it was provoked by the fact that the prime minister, upon resigning, had his thugs outside his office beat up on peaceful protesters. For months, Sri Lanka has suffered prolonged power outages, some lasting 20 hours, and shortages of essentials like food, fuel, gas, and medicine. The island nation of 22 million, stuck in an economic crisis, now adds another challenge an embattled president, and a question over who might take over as prime minister. Who would want to try to take over the reins of the government when you have angry protesters in the street? Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News, London. We thank Kristen for that. It's still ahead tonight, the deadly police shooting back here at home. Newly released body cam footage showing the killing of an unarmed black man in Oklahoma. The criminal charges those officers are now facing. Plus, rappers, young thug arrested on gang charges with the Grammy winners accused of and the other big name indicted. And celebrity chef Mario Batali acquitted today in a sexual misconduct trial why the judge said the accuser had credibility issues. Stay with us. Top stories just getting started on this Tuesday night. Back now with two former Oklahoma police officers who have been charged with manslaughter for the fatal shooting of an unarmed black man in Oklahoma. The charge is coming after police released more than 20 minutes of body cam footage showing the deadly encounter. Sinclair SMY has the latest, and a warning to our viewers, this footage is disturbing. Tonight, two former officers charged with fatally shooting an unarmed black man. On Friday, the city of Lawton, Oklahoma, released edited body camera video that appears to show 29-year-old Quadri Sanders shot by Nathan Ronan and Robert Hinkle in December while his hands appear to be up. 
New 911 calls offer insight into the incident. Y'all have been called out to the house several times for violation of protective order. The, um, he's in the house right now with a gun. The caller phoning with dispatchers at least four times. Now, I'm just trying to make sure there's somebody on the way already because it's been 25 minutes and he's still in the house with a gun. The Lawton police responded. Officials say Sanders went out a side door before emerging through the front of the house. Sanders appears to pause in response to officer commands. He does not flee and does not appear to have a no, weapon. No, Sanders, no, with a baseball cap in his hand, seemingly complies, then is shot. He falls to the ground, his hands raised over his head. We've paused the graphic video, but you can hear rounds of gunshots fired again while Sanders is on the ground. The officers appear to stand over a dying Sanders for about two minutes before mentioning medical aid. According to police, he was pronounced dead at the hospital. After the officers asking one another, did you see it? Initially, the police department says the officers were placed on paid leave, then terminated after an administrative investigation. Now, after a months long criminal investigation, those two officers, Ronan and Hinkle, charged with first degree manslaughter. He was shot multiple times while trying to comply with the lawful commands from the police officers. Sanders' family has hired prominent civil rights attorney Lee Merritt. What does justice look like for the family? Well, this is an officer who was already involved in a previous uh, shooting. We plan to pursue that justice in the form of a federal civil rights suit. But more importantly, we need this officer to finally go to jail for his crimes. In 2021, former officer Ronan was involved in another unrelated fatal shooting of a 24-year-old black man, Zontarius Johnson. In this edited body cam video released by police, Johnson is alleged by police to have raised a 9mm gun in then-officer Ronan's direction during an on-foot police chase. He was fatally shot by Ronan. Ronan then cleared of wrongdoing by the county DA, but Johnson's mother continues to speak out. And when I found out it was the same officer, it just, it just broke my heart. It just broke my because I feel like all this could have really been avoided. If the attorney for both former officers alleges they were familiar with Sanders due to previous unconfirmed police contacts. The medical examiner tells us that he had 12 gunshot wounds. What's your reaction to that? The overkill given in this situation is really shocking to me, and it has really set this family back. All right, Zinclair SMW joins us now live. Zinclair, you know, that story, I mean, it, it is disturbing to watch all this, but I want to make sure we clear things up for viewers here. Both 911 calls came in claiming that, that he had a gun, but what happened when officers actually, you know, approached him? There, there, there was no weapon and they, they never found a weapon on him? That's right, Tom. So the caller called dispatchers about four times, and in that call we hear the voice of a woman saying there is a man armed inside the house. However, when officers arrived, he was not armed. They did, police did say that after they found a gun near the front door. However, the only thing in his hands were a baseball cap, Tom. And so that's what has a lot of people focused on this. We do know that the two former officers are scheduled to be in court in August for first preliminary hearings. Uh, and we know, as we heard, that they've been involved with other officer-involved shootings. So it's likely that this will go on for quite some time. And the city, of course, is grappling with what's really disturbing footage, Tom. Yeah, it is. Okay, Sinclair SMO for us tonight. Sinclair, we appreciate that. Still to come, the Coast Guard rescue, the tense moment showing one crew battling heavy seas to bring sailors to safety after a rogue wave hit their boat. We'll be right back. All right, we're back now with Top Stories Newsfeed, and we begin with an update on the deadly sidewalk shove here in New York City. A judge ordering Lauren Pazienza to be held without bail ruling she could be a serious flight risk. She's accused of pushing an 87-year-old voice coach to the ground back in March, killing her. Hacienza faces up to 25 years in prison if convicted. Rapper Young Thug was arrested on gang-related charges in Georgia. The Grammy winner is one of 28 people named in a 56-count indictment. He's charged with conspiracy to violate the state's RICO Act and participating in street gang activity. Prosecutors say he was a founder of a violent gang called Young Slime Life. The rapper Gunna was also indicted. 
Next to the dramatic rescue about 100 miles off the coast of New York's Long Island, dramatic new video shows a Coast Guard crew saving sailors on a vessel damaged by a rogue wave. Officials say when they got there, the boat had been demastered and all four sailors were injured, the crew battling heavy seas to get everyone to safety. The sailors are expected to be okay. And Netflix could have some big changes soon. Sources telling CNBC that Netflix executives have told employees they're working to roll out an ad-supported option by the end of this year. That's faster than the streaming giant initially suggested. Netflix is also expecting to get tougher on password sharing around the same time. All right, now to the verdict in the Mario Batali sexual misconduct trial. The celebrity chef found not guilty by a judge after waiving his right to a jury trial. He was accused of groping a woman who posed for a selfie with him in 2017. NBC News Now's Issa Gutierrez has that story. Tonight, the heat off Mario Batali. Turn off the heat. A judge in Boston found the celebrity chef not guilty in a sexual misconduct case Tuesday afternoon. So Mr. Batali and attorney Fuller and Caruso, if you could rise, I'm, I'm going to find the defendant not guilty to the charge of indecent assault and battery. The chef immediately kissing one of his lawyers on the cheek after the verdict. Batali was charged with indecent assault and battery in an alleged incident at a Boston restaurant in 2017. The woman who accused him took the stand Monday. Media was directed to not film her face. When we went to go take the selfie, he had his hands all over my body, all over sensitive areas in between my legs, my rear end, my breasts. The 32-year-old software company worker testified that Batali forcibly kissed and groped her after taking a selfie with her. His face was all over mine. His tongue was in my ear at a certain point. Batali pleaded not guilty and waived his right to a jury trial, putting his fate in the judge's hands. His lawyer argued the assault never happened and questioned the accuser's credibility. She's not being truthful. This has been fabricated for money and for fun. For nearly two decades, the Italian-American chef was known for Food Network shows like Iron Chef, Molto Mario, and his signature ponytail and orange Crocs. This is the first one we're going to make. It's called Sagnatiele, which is a very specific noodle. In 2016, Batali was even the featured chef at President Obama's final state dinner. The 61-year-old's fall from grace began a year later, when Eater New York reported accusations of sexual misconduct from four anonymous women in the midst of the media. To movement. The women said Batali groped them and made inappropriate comments of a sexual nature. Do you have any recommendations for wines that should be served cold? I have several. In response, Batali was fired from ABC's The Chew and took a leave of absence from day-to-day -day operations of his businesses. Batali issued an apology acknowledging the allegations, saying they, quote, match up with the ways he'd acted. The apology also included a recipe for pizza dough cinnamon rolls. P.S. In case you're searching for a holiday-inspired breakfast, he wrote. Later in 2018, new allegations from several women who worked at the Spotted Pig, a New York City restaurant where Batali was an investor and frequent guest. In interviews with CBS's 60 Minutes, the women alleged Batali had sexually harassed or assaulted them. I was on his lap, kissing him, like he was kissing me. She says she woke up around dawn in a room on the third floor of the building. The first thing I think is I've been drugged. That was the first thing I thought is I've been, I've been assaulted. Tali vehemently denied the spotted pig allegations in a statement where he also wrote he was not attempting a professional comeback. Police in New York launched a criminal investigation into the matter, but in 2019 decided not to press charges against Batali. The state attorney general's office then announced a separate investigation into the chef's alleged discrimination and retaliation, resulting in a settlement last year. Batali, his business partner, and their company, B&B Hospitality, paying $600,000 to at least 20 former employees. In the Boston trial verdict this week, the judge questioned whether the accuser could be believed. The complaining witness has significant credibility issues. Those issues were highlighted in her testimony. He cited outside incidents, a plausible financial motive, and inconsistencies between her story and the selfies of her and Batali from that night. The pictures tell a thousand words. NBC News reached out to Batali, his accuser, and their representation for comment and did not immediately hear back.
Batali had been convicted, he could have faced up to two and a half years in prison, and he could have had to register on uh, as a sex offender. Of course, that didn't happen. Uh, he was found not guilty today by that judge in Boston. Still, though, despite this verdict, Tom, it is unlikely at this point that we're going to see him uh, back on TV, back at restaurants anytime soon, because keep in mind, Batali really took, again, a big step back professionally two years before he pleaded not guilty in this particular case, given the many allegations. Okay, Issa, thank you for that. We want to turn now to money talks. What consumers and investors need to know from the business world and beyond, a hot housing market is leaving many Americans unable to afford the sky-high price of a new home, but could climbing mortgage rates be enough to cool it down? NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer reports. So this is my favorite room in the house. As rents rise and now mortgage rates climb, the Fishers, like so many other American families, are trying desperately to buy a home while facing a tougher housing market every day. With low inventory and record high prices, if they wait any longer, their 30-year fixed mortgage could tick up even higher. We're definitely willing to make more sacrifices than we were at the beginning. The typical mortgage payment in March was $1,700, up nearly $400 from a year ago. Yeah, you kind of don't know when it's going to end with the mortgage rates rising. With inflation going up too, I mean, everything's getting more expensive. Though the housing market remains hot, there are some signs of cooling. The average 30-year fixed mortgage rate has now climbed to 5.36%, up two points from a year ago. That's led to an 11 percent drop in new mortgage applications. Still, many prospective homeowners are lowering expectations and raising budgets. It's definitely squeezing some people out, but again, demand is still there and it's great far exceeding supply. To get their foot into the door, families aren't just willing to pay more for less. Many are turning to adjustable rate loans, where the interest rate can change after five, seven, or 10 years. We think in 2022 with higher mortgage rates, that'll cool down somewhat. We'll be back to more typical market conditions. But after Lots losing on multiple Lots offers, the Fisher family wants to buy now in order to save later, or else they worry their American dream could become a nightmare. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News, Los Angeles. We thank Miguel for that. For a closer look on what's going on in the housing market right now, and a bit of positive news, if you will, I want to bring in CNBC's real estate correspondent, Diane Olick. Diana, you know, we heard a lot of bad news there in Miguel's report, but there is a bright side when it comes to housing inventory. What are realtors seeing out there right now? Well, Tom, Realtor.com actually just reported its April numbers, and it showed that the supply of acting listings was still down about 12 percent year over year. But that was actually the smallest annual drop we've seen in three years. And then they looked just at the last week in April, and supply was only down 3 percent. So their chief economist, Danielle Hale, said April data suggests a positive turn of events is on the horizon for weary buyers. Of course, weary buyers are now facing not just high home prices, but rising mortgage rates. And that's, in fact, what is actually helping the supply. Higher mortgage rates are sidelining some buyers and consequently slowing sales, which leaves more on the market. Right. It's um, definitely not a buyer's market just yet. What are you, where are you seeing supply go up? What parts of the country? Well, actually, a few markets are already in the positive. That's Phoenix, Kansas City, Detroit, Memphis, and even Austin, which was a super hot market during the pandemic. But most markets still have fewer active listings than last year. And some of the biggest drops are in Chicago, L.A., Miami, Raleigh, Seattle, right here in D.C., and Boston. And even so, I spoke to an agent in Boston who said she's having some very difficult conversations with her sellers because even with slow supply, today's buyers no longer say the sky is the limit on price. So you have to get a little more real than that, Tom. Yeah, so I'm sure there's a reality check out there. So I guess the million-dollar question is, will more active listings finally take some of these heat off these crazy high home prices, or is it going to take more and more time? Yeah, the short answer is maybe. Prices usually lag sales by about six months, and we've seen sales drop for about five months now. You also, though, have higher mortgage rates, which tend to lower prices, 
Here's the big issue, though. Demand is still very strong. You've got that huge millennial group still wanting to buy homes. And while supply is starting to increase slightly, it's still very low historically, especially at the entry level. And that's really where we need to see the supply most. Diana, before you go, you know, you mentioned mortgages. Talk to our viewers about these ARM loans we just heard about there in Miguel's piece, these adjustable rate mortgages. You know, a lot of these ARM uh, loans came up when we were talking about the great housing crisis in 2008. So what's the difference this time around and what do viewers need to know? Okay, these are not the arms of 2008. I repeat, not the same arms. There are very strong underwriting on these arms. You have to have down payments. You have to have good credit scores. You have to actually be able to pay the loan off, which back then you didn't have to. Also, you have to remember that adjustable rate mortgages can be fixed for five, seven, 10 years. So that's a fixed rate time. They will adjust to the market once those terms are up, but they offer much lower interest rates for that longer term. So if you only expect to be in the house for seven or 10 years, it's a great option. All right, Diana Olick Forrest. Diana, we thank you for that. Next, today is the first ever National Fentanyl Awareness Day, an effort by the DEA to spread the word about the synthetic opioid that now accounts for nearly two thirds of all overdose deaths in the U.S. Kate Snow tonight on the simple tool advocates say can prevent these deaths. And they're giving it away for free. On a recent Friday in LA, students from USC were handing out free kits used to test drugs for the presence of deadly fentanyl. One line means there's fentanyl present, which means you don't take the drug. Their harm reduction group is called TACO, Team Awareness Combating Overdose. Madeline Hilliard founded TACO in 2020, following a year when a dozen USC students died of an overdose. She and co-founder Jack Elliott were neuroscience majors and saw a need to educate. Our goal is to remove any and all barriers so that you have absolutely no reason not to be testing your drugs. They've handed out 10,000 free test strips at campuses across California and now shipped to schools around the country. Students can also use an app to have strips delivered within 10 minutes for one cent plus delivery. Fentanyl is a big deal because you can take it accidentally. There could be a couple grains of sand size amount of fentanyl in your drug and that can kill you. Of the nearly 100,000 overdose deaths between June 2020 and June 2021, 64% were fentanyl related. For people 15 to 24 years old, 78% of deaths involved fentanyl. You want to grab the tip of the strip. We went to NJ Labs to better understand how the test strips work. In the real world, someone testing a pill or powder would dissolve a tiny portion in water. Similar to a home pregnancy or COVID test, we watch for lines. There's only one line. That one line means there's fentanyl. There's fentanyl in that product, in that solution. That means throw the drug away. Do you think these tests are fairly accurate? They're fairly accurate and sensitive enough to test very trace low levels of fentanyl. Some states consider the test strips drug paraphernalia and make distributing them illegal. Critics worry they encourage people to use drugs. They were going to use drugs whether we gave them the test strips or not. The difference is now with the test strips, if they find fentanyl in it, that means that they are going to wake up tomorrow. If I'm going to use drugs, I'm going to go this 21-year-old college student requested anonymity to speak openly. At a party, she and her best friends went to the bathroom to test a bag of cocaine some were planning to use. When the strip showed positive, they sat in stunned silence. If you hadn't known some of your friends were, were about to do it, what do you think might have happened? One of them could have at least died, if not all of them. So it was super jarring to think that like they could have died. And these are people that I like spend every day with. It would have changed like everything about how I live right now and I imagine going forward. Taco's goal is to create positive peer pressure. If you're going to use a drug, test it first. Give them to friends, family, whoever. Hoping that small step saves lives. Kate Snow, NBC News, New Brunswick, New Jersey. We thank Kate for that one. Time now for Top Stories Global Watch. And we start in Mexico where two more journalists have been killed. Officials say two reporters from the news website El Veraz were found shot to death outside a convenience store in the state of Veracruz. Their murders coming just days after another journalist was found dead in Sinaloa. Eleven journalists have been killed in Mexico so far this year. And officials in Bolivia say a tear gas grenade triggered a deadly stampede at a university. New video shows a crowd of people trying to escape a cloud of gas inside the school's auditorium. At least four students were killed and dozens injured. The stampede reportedly happened when students gathered to elect new student body leaders, authorities are working to figure out who set off the grenade.
All right, when we come back, the son of the Philippines' former dictator said to become president. What the Marcos family's return to power could mean for the future of that country. Next. All right, welcome back. We head to the Philippines now and a stunning election victory. Ferdinand Marcos Jr. poised to become the nation's next president. And if that name sounds familiar, the vote comes 36 years after his father, the country's former dictator, was overthrown in the 80s and his family was forced to flee the country. Priscilla Thompson has the latest. <laughs> Tonight, a brutal dictator's son winning the presidential election in the Philippines by a landslide. Let us bring Filipinos back to one another in service of our country, facing the crisis and the challenges of the future together. Thousands gathered to celebrate the unimaginable victory, a return to power for the Marcos family after being overthrown and forced to flee the country decades earlier. An endeavor as large as this does not involve one person. It involves very, very many people. Preliminary results show Ferdinand Marcos Jr. earned more than 31 million votes, twice as many as his bitter rival and the current vice president, Lenny Robredo. The Philippines is moving from basically from one presidential administration that has been accused of being governed in a dictatorial fashion to one that could potentially be that way. It's that alliance um, and relationship that has left some folks quite uneasy. This is my son, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Marcos Jr. was a young boy when his father became president in 1965. For nine years in his more than two-decade rule, Marcos Sr. declared martial law, a first in the country's history, prompted by an assassination attempt on a chief aide. The uh, proclamation of martial law is not a military takeover. During this time, thousands of labor leaders, politicians, and students were arrested. News outlets shut down, and enemies of the president detained, tortured, and even murdered. The family has also been accused of siphoning billions of state dollars during their time in power, something they deny. The family is believed to have stolen between 10 to 15 billion dollars worth of goods, 15 mink coats, hundreds of handbags, and more than a thousand pairs of shoes are among the valuables the state has since recovered. Ousted from power during the 1986 People Power Revolution, the family fled to Hawaii, where three years later the elder Ferdinand died. The, documented report the family returned to the Philippines in the 1990s, again leveraging their political influence. Their matriarch served four terms in the House of Representatives, at one point mounting her own bid for the presidency. Marcos Jr.'s sister, now a senator. Meanwhile, the young boy seen in photos alongside his father all those years ago, becoming a governor, congressman, senator. Ferdinand R. Marcos Jr., having been elected to the position of senator of the Republic of the and is now preparing to take hold of the highest office in the land. What does this win tell us about the direction that the country is heading in? I think what's really interesting to see in the years ahead is really how the Philippines positions itself in Asia as, um, as a democratic nation. Uh, but as of now, it seems as though um, the voters have spoken in the Philippines and they're ready to see what a, uh, a Marcos presidency is going to look like. All right, Priscilla Thompson joins us now from here in 30 Rock. So, Priscilla, preliminary results also showing a landslide for the vice presidential pick, I understand. Another name that will be familiar to voters? That's right, Tom. Sarah Duterte Carpio, uh, that name likely familiar because she is the current president's daughter, now poised to become the vice president. And it's interesting, in talking to experts about this, they say it may have been those names that uh, thrusted these folks to victory in the first place because it brought credibility to their campaign. They ran on this sort of vague platform about unity, uh, not really getting into any specifics or talking about change. But that is all also, what has critics concerned that this could just be a continuation of some of the legacies of their families uh, that some folks say is concerning. Tom? All right, Priscilla Thompson for us. Priscilla, thank you for that. Coming up, COVID delayed a lot of things for one Marine. It impacted his return home. We'll show you a reunion years in the making after this break. Finally tonight, a brother surprise three years in the making. A combination of service and COVID kept the two apart but not anymore. 
It's been three long years since Texas third grader Brandon Ballard saw his older brother Isaac. Isaac is a Marine corporal stationed in Okinawa, Japan. The pandemic delayed his return stateside. The only way Brandon has seen his older brother was on video. But then yesterday, when Brandon and his classmates thought they were attending a pep rally, this happened. Hey, Brandon. in the Marines. Um, how long has it been since you've seen Brandon? Mm, roughly three years. Three years. Wow. I was nervous to see him because I haven't seen him so long, but I was really glad I got to. After three long years apart, the brothers get to spend the next three weeks together. Someone they love is gone for that long. I mean, oh no. <laughs> it's just like happy and excited that he's staying at home for a while. So what a great surprise. So let's give him a round of applause. And we're also clapping all the way here in New York. The brothers tell our NBC affiliate in Dallas they plan on spending a lot of time together fishing. That sounds about right. We also want to thank our Dallas station for their help with that story. And we thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Have a great night. But stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.